Those in Kettering, you're listening to Dayton's ESPN Radio, 1410 Wing AM. Dayton sports fans, don't forget to follow and subscribe to ESPN Dayton's YouTube channel. Listen, watch, interact. Search ESPN Dayton on YouTube. Acts like I've done this before. A You're a pro. You're a pro. Trying. Trying. We're off and rolling here on a Friday. Welcome in. It's the Kenner and Kev Show. Dayton ESPN Radio, 1410 Wing AM and live on the Chatterbox Sports Network, of course. I'm Justin Kenner. He's Kev Nash. Mr. Kev Nash, welcome. What up, though? Happy Friday. Good Friday to you, sir. I think we got, uh, I'm hoping, I'm hoping, like some of the the uh, the sound issues from yesterday, I think we got that ironed out. I think we the, the new cameras, the whole new studio is off and rolling. We're off and rolling, and we got a lot to get into here on a Friday. Man, there's so much to talk about. Obviously, still going to break down the trade from the Texans and the Bills and how it oh, yeah. affects everybody in the AFC North. We got the Women's Final Four tonight in my hometown of Cleveland, Ohio. We got the Men's Final Four on Saturday. Going to do some predictions about that and so much more. Oh, yes, and the Association Catch-Up. That's coming up here in just a little bit. Uh, we talked with our friend Jason Fitz, Fitzy. Uh, Yahoo Sports. He's going to come on, on with us on Monday. Uh, we're actually gonna, he's going to jump on the new camera system. I mean, we're we're gonna we're trying some new stuff, and that's all that matters. And that's of course thanks to our friends over uh, at Chatterbox Sports, and that's all that matters. Now, uh, so Jason Fitz covers uh, he's covering the Final Four. We're going to preview the national championship game on Monday night, of course. But he's going to come on with us on Monday. Uh, but yeah, a lot to dive into heading into this weekend. The Dayton Dragons open up tonight. Nice. Uh, I'm Rhett Louder on the on the mound, and that was the Reds' uh, first round draft pick from last year. So a lot of people excited about that. You know, I did my uh, my news hit this morning uh, with Nathan Edwards, and we were talking about you know just how much the Dragons means to the city of Cincinnati and, and why that is. And I said, look, I think the one thing that's unique about the Reds, you know, it's it's a double edged sword. The Cincinnati Reds, we would love them to spend money like the Yankees. We would love them to spend money like the Dodgers. We would love them to, to spend money. You're a Guardians fan. Like, mm-hmm. your team doesn't spend money either, and it's very frustrating. I mean, that's why they, they brag about weird things like, oh, you know, look at it. We made the playoffs with, like, the second lowest payroll in baseball. And as we talked about last Friday, I'm not a fan of that because it kind of bails, it, it bails teams out. You know, ownership wants to look at their fans and say, oh, look, you know, we didn't spend a lot of money, but we don't have to because, you know, we have good players. And it's like, well, if you were that good with the second lowest payroll in baseball, imagine what you would have done maybe with the fifth or sixth lowest payroll in baseball. Imagine if you had choose. Yeah. Um, But no, I think that the reason that even throughout all the losing over the years with the Cincinnati Reds, the reason we, especially here as Reds fans in Dayton, still feel as connected to that team as we do is because we feel connected to them because we've watched some of these players, if not most of them, grow up. We, we watch them play here in Dayton. Right. You know, we, you know, we hear their name on draft day. We you know, wait to see where they're going to be assigned, um, even if it's you know, lower than Dayton. Of course, they, they get assigned to Dayton. Of course, we watch them at Day Air Ballpark, and then we watch them move on and move up and get promoted and, and all that type of stuff. So then by the time they get to the May, we feel like you know we were a part of their come up, and I think that's what makes uh, the connection with the Reds so special, especially having the Dragons here in town. And the guy that I know we're going to see and talk a lot of with the Reds in you know in the near future, Rhett Louder, are going to be on the mound tonight. Uh, Cam Collier is going to be playing tonight too. I know uh, we talked about that with Marty Brenneman a while back. I mean, Marty, that was one of the key players. I remember heading into last year's opening day, we were asking Marty about some of the top young prospects, and he was very high on Cam Collier. Yeah, I'm just looking at the weather for tonight. You know, that's always like kind of like one of my things. <laughs> you know, we were at opening day last year, and you went this year, and I'm always just like concerned about the weather. I don't know. I'm I'm just a weather geek like that. I just hope like that the obviously the games get played. It looks like that we're done with rain uh, for the looks like for the foreseeable future. So, Dragons get it on tonight. Yeah, and again, we'll see uh, what happens there. A little chilly because yeah. I'm wearing shorts. <laughs> I'm wearing shorts. So there's that, but uh, it, I'm always gonna wear shorts. I'm fat. I can't, and I'm short, and I can't find pa- pants that fit. I wear the same pants all the time, and people are like, "Did you wear that yesterday?" I'm like, "If you find me a second pair of pants that fits me comfortably, okay, I will wear more than one pair of pants a week." That's why I wear shorts during the winter. I find a lot of shorts that fit. Some sweatpants. Mm, can't wear that, you know. You know the boss. You know he's very strict around here. You know you don't want to. <laughs> you don't want to cross our boss. I mean, 
<laughs> unacceptable. Can't have that. So, nonetheless. Never says anything to me. <laughs> no, just me. I wonder why that is. Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, let's look at what's trending around the world. <laughs> it was very close to being the Kev Nash show today. It still might be. I have no clue. I have no clue what the ramifications of my actions are going to be. But until then, I'm going to enjoy going to be a whole sports. lot of basketball talk, going to be a whole lot of college football talk, a whole lot of Ohio State talk if it's just me. If it's just <laughs> you, and there's a good chance it can be. <laughs> I mean, I thought if I was going to get fired, I'd be fired on a Friday. But then my wife said she took a lot of HR courses and stuff. They said the best day to fire someone is Tuesday. Really? So just because I'm back on Monday doesn't mean it's the Kinner and Kev show moving forward. It's mm. if I come back on Wednesday or am on the air Tuesday after. I have no idea. Let's think positive. I'm I feel a lot more positive after today. Let's see what's trending. Something come in the mail. <laughs> Imagine that. Just wait 24 hours. You could have avoided this disaster. But anyways. All right, here we go. Uh, Florida State transfer Tom House tells On3 Sports that the following schools have contacted him since entering the transfer portal. Of course, Tom House, the Centerville mm-hmm. product, um, had a lot of big schools after him coming out of high school. He ultimately committed to Florida State. Um, but he has entered the transfer portal, as pretty much every college athlete does at some point in, or another. But, Kev, there's a lot of interesting names on this list that have contacted Tom House, but there's a name that I'm really interested in, and that is, of course, Indiana State's interesting, but Wright State. Mm. Wright State is a team that has reached out to Tom House, and I cannot think of a better way um, for the Clint Sargent era to, to kick off or tip off for Wright State than to get a hometown product like that. That would be huge, especially a product coming from a high school dynasty type of feel mm-hmm. with the center of Oh, because I would love to see Tom House go to Wright State if that's possible. Absolutely. Uh, just a couple years ago, we saw when we had somebody from the city plan for Wright State and Amari Davis, the whole city of Trotwood would come out there every single home game for Wright State. Now you imagine bringing that same crowd and that same energy from the Centerville uh, part of town over to the Nutter Center. That would do wonders for attendance, and we're mm-hmm. always talking about attendance. We're talking about crowd participation. It would be awesome, and obviously, you know, opportunity for uh, Tom House to come home and, and get some shots up with the Raiders. Obviously, we're super biased. <coughs> we want him to come home and play for our beloved Raiders. I want what's best for him, mostly importantly, but, you know, hey, if the Raiders are the best place for you, I will gladly accept you. Yeah, for our Chatterbox audience that's just getting to know us a little bit here in Dayton, and of course, um, we uh, we were Dayton's radio home for Wright State basketball. So you know, obviously, we lean. You know, we have a bias for Wright State, of course, and uh, to get a hometown product like Tom House would be pretty pretty cool, uh, no doubt about it. Lights out shooter, man, uh, and, and that offense too. That would mm-hmm. be kind of nice. All right, uh, continuing on what's trending here. How about this? So all the chatter after LSU on the women's side got knocked out of the tournament by Iowa last week in the most watched women's basketball game in the history of college basketball. Twelve point one million viewers. Um, you know, obviously, Angel Reese had declared for the WNBA draft. That was one point of, of talking point, of course. But for the second year in a row, Haley Van Lith is entering the transfer portal. A source tells, uh, you know, The Athletic. Uh, last year, she considered Stanford and South Carolina in addition to LSU. Uh, the female Kevin Durant on the move again, Kev. <laughs> you know, uh, Haley, she's a shooting guard. And she was, for lack of a better word, forced to play the point guard for LSU. She's not a point guard. She's a shooting guard. She's a, a shooter. She's a scoring guard. And, you know, the offense that she was being forced to run um, just kind of, like, shackled her. Like, yep. it wasn't allowing her to play at her best. Now, granted, it helped LSU win a whole bunch of ball games, and, you know, they run more of a motion offense, throw it into the post with Angel Reese, a lot of high flares for uh, Flo J. Johnson. So, like, her offense never flourished there, and they wanted to bring her there to be that knockdown shooter. It just never worked out with them, with her and LSU. So she's on the move again. And she's going to sit back and wait to see who wins the title, and then she'll go to that team, right? <laughs> no, but uh, she definitely – and look, Kim Mulkey, t- she made sure to point that out, that, hey, um, she took she made a major sacrifice coming here. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, it's not that, oh, she went there and she wasn't as good as everyone thought. No, the, the sacrifice was the numbers. Yeah. Um, but I think she wants to get to the league, so the best way is to go somewhere where she's going to be able to kind of – really put her numbers on full display again. yeah man she was like a 23 point per game scorer oh, yeah. uh, at louisville like i mean people talk about you know even i talked about the last year matchup between louisville and iowa where caitlin Carp put up 41 but she put up 25 in that game as well like they were at a point in that game before iowa pulled away and caitlin clark went caitlin clark they were going bucket for bucket so she's a bucket she just wasn't able to be that bucket with lsu Justin Kenner, Kev Nash, Dayton's ESPN Radio 
1410 Wing AM Chatterbox Sports on YouTube. We are off and rolling here uh, on a Friday. What's trending around the world of sports? We'll get to the chat coming up here uh, and get some of your reaction um, to some of our talking points here in just a moment. Continuing to go uh, down the list here. How about this? Uh, a name for Bengals fans that, you know, I thought was an interesting move when the Bengals cut this individual because when they signed him, I was like, okay, that's a big time move when they got this guy from the Dallas Cowboys originally. Uh, but Lyle Collins, who never really lived up to the expectations in his short stint in Cincinnati. But then when, you know, there was talks of him getting healthy and preparing to come back and then the Bengals just outright cut him. It surprised a lot of people, including myself. Uh, but Lyle Collins back on his feet and he has signed a one year deal um, with the Buffalo Bills, Kev. Really? Yes. That's very interesting. Especially because uh, they said he wanted to go to a perennial Super Bowl contender. <laughs> Ufa. Yeah, I mean, everything with this uh, Bills since is reset. But, you know, I, I do have a different take on that. I'm sure we'll get to that a little bit later. But, you know, speaking about Collins, I mean, you know, he's up there in age. He's super banged up all the time. I mean, I guess he's looking for just like one last payday. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, look. Good offensive linemen are tough to find, but I will say, look, uh, if if he goes there and he struggles and he doesn't look like the old Lyle Collins and he looks like old Lyle Collins, then you know what? Kudos to the Bengals for seeing something that a lot of people questioned whether that was a good move or not. But if he goes there and looks really, really good, considering the Bengals' O-line issues in the years past, some people might question it. But I will say the Bengals, it's taken a long time. I think they may have patched up that offensive line enough to be a little dangerous, but uh, we'll find out uh, what happens uh, this coming up season continuing to go down the list again uh, if you're just jumping in uh, our top headlines around the world of sports uh, right now how about this one kev wide receiver rasheed rice mm. uh, okay he kind of you know a little hit and run or whatever it was that he was involved in but now you can add a marijuana charge on top of it 10.8 grams of marijuana was found in the lamborghini that Ch chiefs wide receiver rasheed rice was driving and was involved in a major crash per the police that is the amount of a felony in Texas along with jail time. So this situation just continues to get worse. And look, this was a receiver that, and look, this isn't even football related. I mean, it's football because he's a football player. He started to look like a potential weapon, a legitimate weapon that uh, Patrick Mahomes can count on, uh, but obviously won't be able to count on him much moving forward. I don't see him playing in 2024. Maybe not again, depending on how serious these charges are. Yeah, he became the most reliable weapon outside of Travis Kelsey, and then for a point in the season, he was more reliable than Travis Kelsey. Travis Kelsey had uh, the case of the drops as well. People don't look at that because he's Travis Kelsey. He's a Hall of Famer. He's a great player, but he was a guy that was dropping passes as well. You know, Rice is not a burner by any stretch of imagination, but he catches the ball, and he's a big physical wide receiver that can take a short pass and take it the distance, a la T.O. So he's not T.O., but, I mean, you know, he's in that mode. So this is a huge setback potentially for the Kansas City Chiefs. I mean, just when you thought, like, are right, you getting rid of Kadarius Tony? You think you found the situation with Rice. You signed um, Hollywood Brown. Like, okay, we got our wide receiving course set out. But now you have this situation going on with him. I mean, for me, like, okay, obviously the amount of weed, obviously a felony in the state of Texas, obviously bad. What, what's that in the state of Ohio? <laughs> do I need to get it down to eight grams? What do I need to get need it to get down to? a little to? bit lower than that, buddy. Uh, well, obviously, but the, the, the fact that he was involved in basically a hit and run slash drag racing on the highway and fled the scene, for me, is way worse than the marijuana situation, man. You could have killed somebody. And even if you did kill somebody, you just upped and walked away. Like, that's that speaks to character. That speaks to, hey, man, like, you need to really look yourself in the mirror and say, what's going on here? Like, this, this to me says you have a problem. Why is it like, I mean, I'm not rich, but if I became rich, would I become obsessed with driving fast? Man, that's the crazy thing. Like, uh, how many how many of these stories have come from the NFL and just the NBA? Where these And it's more so the NFL than anything. Yeah. Where it's this type of these types of storyline now this one's a little bit more severe but i mean just like like all these athletes almost every summer it seems to be your off season there's some story um about these guys in these types of situations i think it's an age thing i really think it's an age thing because you don't hear about you know what i'm saying guys of the kevin durant age and the steph curry age getting into these type of situations guys of like that age like the 28 and ups like they know, all right, man, if I'm going out, I'm going to get car service, like, and stuff like that. Like, people of this age, they get some money in their pocket. They get a car. They want to drive said car. They don't want to have somebody else driving the car. They bought the car for them to drive. Uh, you think about, like, all the speeding issues that happen with the Georgia football team. Like, yeah. I mean, shoot, they had somebody on staff and a player 
die in a car crash and guys on the football team are still getting into situations uh trevor Etienne, the transfer running back from florida trevor's uh younger brother who transferred there he just got into this exact same situation with marijuana and speeding and i'm not sure like what the deal is is it since athens is so close to atlanta like people are going to atlanta to kick it for the night and then speeding back to campus or something like that it's it's a youth thing i think it really has everything to do with the ages between 18 to 25 where like hey man you just do a whole bunch of stupid stuff it's the kenner and kev show here on 1410 espn radio last one uh here and again on what's trending last night if you had a chance to watch the nit championship i know everyone nit nit everyone's in love with the nit right uh but last night the good one between seton hall uh, and, of course, Indiana State. And uh, Indiana State, a fun story, a fun team to watch. But uh, Indiana State head coach Josh Schertz uh, is now heading to St. Louis. And that should be official within the next 24 hours, according to Jeff Goodman. Schertz will get paid significantly more around that $2 million range per season. Big money, big money. Um, The thing about the NIT championship last night, I think – Everybody around the country, especially you and I, were rooting for two teams to make it to the championship game. One, obviously, Ohio State, because obviously we're the home of Ohio State basketball, football as well, um, and rooting for Indiana State. That was the matchup that I wanted to see. I think that, you know, that Indiana State got job by not being in the tournament. But on the flip side, like, I honestly never thought about anybody else making it until I watched the championship game. I didn't even know Seton Hall was in the NIT, to be perfectly honest. And then I remember their head coach, Shane Holloway. The Cox. Yeah. Yeah. So he he's he's coaching his alma mater. So we like to talk about like all the failures of alma mater coaches. Like we talked about Clyde Jexer failing at Houston. We talked about um shoot, things that actually happened early on in Coach AG's situation at UD. Like, hey man, this is a little rocky. Obviously they righted the ship this year, got a win in the NCAA tournament, but like these things don't work out. Patrick Ewan going back to Georgetown. And not working out, them having to let uh, uh, one of their all-time players go as the head coach. Shane Holloway, he just brought a banner back to Seton Hall. Granted, it's an NIT banner, but shoot, when you've been down for so long like Seton Hall, if to my recollection, I can't remember the last time that Seton Hall was good, maybe 2000 with Andre Barrett. And I think even Shaheem Holloway was like a senior on that team. And that's so, how far back they So, like, that's how long ago it was. Like, he was playing last time like they were relevant on the map. And they had some big wins this year. I think they beat mm -hmm. Houston. I think they beat UConn. They beat UConn, yeah. And like so, they had some wins. They they proved they just obviously a young team, not consistent enough, but they were consistent enough to get it done uh, against Milk Chamberlain, <laughs> Indiana State. Is Milk Chamberlain a senior? Yes, he is. Really? Yeah, but I think he's a COVID senior, so he can come back or hit the transfer portal. Kareem <laughs> Abdul, Kareem Abdul Jabbar. I hope he comes back. I hope he I, he might follow his coach to to St. Louis. The A-10 can have some very interesting characters next season if some of these things uh, go down. As far as is that a better concerned. job? $2 million a year, yeah. <laughs> St. Louis is a good basketball program. I mean, they, they've been a very competitive team in the A-10. I mean, that, they were down this year, but that's a team that consistently always gives UD fits uh, as far as that's concerned. So this is to say you're him, and you get that offer. I'm the AD, and you're like, hey, hey look, they offered me $2 mil. Like, I can get you up to a million. I, would you stay? Would you stay? Would you stay with us? I would and say be a sycamore. I'd say no because look at what they did this year. The Sycamores had to win 28 games. They were a top 25 team for a bit. They had a high net ranking. They did, they did everything that you're supposed to, and they were still left out of the big dance. That's why you take that St. Louis job. Man. That's why you take that St. Louis. The more money, and it's not easy by any means, but it's easier to make the tournament in St. Louis or at St. Louis than it is. Look, Indiana State was dominant this year. And somehow the committee looked at Virginia and said that team's better. <laughs> I, I I don't get it. And we not, got to, we had to watch it here at UD Arena. I mean, oof. Definitely not saying you're wrong. Definitely not saying you're wrong because I believe you're 100 percent correct. If I was the AD, I would rebuttal with, so you're going to leave a one bid league and go to a two bid league. Kind like of a it's, it's a pair. It's a parallel move. It's not a step up. It's not like you're going to the Big Ten or the Big Twelve or the SEC. Like it's it, it's it would be. And I would. That's what I would pitch to him. And obviously, he probably will rebuttal with like, "What's the NIL looking like?" Because I got to get the player, I got to get paid, number one, yep. and I got to get my players paid so we can continue win games. I think the other thing too is, yes, one bid league. Look, I still look at the A10 as a one bid league. I know people are going to say, "Oh, they put two teams in this year." I, I to me, conferences that get two teams in because the number one team choked in the conference tournament, I don't 
like that's a weird one. That, that's backdooring teams in. But hey, it sounds cool. You're a multi bid league, more power to you. You're right. But to the A10's defense, to a certain point, you're playing teams with higher. Look, there's a reason that Dayton remained in the top 25, even with losing, is because right. they were still playing teams that were ranked pretty high in the net to where Indiana State was not. They right. like. That that's the difference. Is there are you know my bad conference is better than your bad <laughs> conference. That's kind of what we're doing. The A10 is not a horrible conference. I think they've just underperformed uh, for quite some time, and I think that's hurt Dayton. Although it semi helped them this year, but Dayton's earned that credibility, I guess. But you know from the uh, from those guys. But we'll see uh, what ends up happening. All right. So we've talked about this in the past. You go to the ballpark, and a monumental career milestone happens, and you catch that ball. You give it back. You give it back. Or, you know, are you, how good of a fan are you that you hold the ball ransom? How, I mean, it, like, I find it very, very odd. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Shohei Otani. A, a, a historic ball that was hit by him. His first home run with the Dodgers turned into, well, quite an interesting scene at Dodger Stadium. We're going to talk about that when we come back. It's the Kenner and Kev Show. Dayton's ESPN Radio, 1410. Wing AM. We'll be right back.
Justin Kinner Show on Facebook. Enter a contest. Weigh in on the latest sports debates. Plus, you can watch Kinner and Kev weekdays at 3 p.m. Yeah, as if listening to them isn't bad enough. Now you can see them. Reds, Bengals, Browns, Buckeyes, and more. Follow the Justin Kinner Show on Facebook. And we are back. It's the Kinner and Kev Show, Dayton's ESPN Radio, 1410 Wing AM. All right, we've had this debate on the show before, Kev, and I wanted to revisit it because it kind of came to a head again recently, or I should say, you know, last night with this Dodger game. So it all happened. Uh, this is an article from The Athletic. The headline, this fan caught Shohei Otani's first home run as a Dodger. Hard feelings ensued. So I, I've, I've talked about this. I've used this, you know, brought up this example in the past. Like, I'm a Reds fan. I love the Cincinnati Reds. If I go to Great American Ballpark and L.A. De La Cruz, and I, I can't remember, I'm, I'm, let's just assume, I don't think he's had three home runs in a game. Let's say he has a historic night. Let's just go back to when he debuted, his first home run as a Red. Let's just make this simple. Let's go back to his first home run as a Cincinnati Red at Great American Ballpark, right? That's a historic, monumental ball for what could potentially be one of the new faces of baseball. And I catch that home run ball. And L.A. De La Cruz... Whether it's him or he no longer has the translator. Very, I mean, he worked you know really hard in the office. I'm not mocking that. Like that was a cool story. Like he talked about the importance of wanting to connect with fans. That's why he worked really hard on his English. But you know, he uh, Ellie De La Cruz, his translator, whoever they come up to you and say, "Hey, that ball means a lot to Ellie. It's his first home run as a Cincinnati Reds. His first home run of his career as a, you know uh, in the major league level. He would like that ball. What what can you know? Can, can we have that? Oh, what's what do you got for me? I'm a horrible fan. That's a D-bag move. That is horrible. Like, you say you love your team. You say you love L.A. De La Cruz. You say you're a diehard Reds fan. But if you catch a monumental ball, why in the blue hell are you going to hold it hostage? That's, that's, that's not screaming great fandom. I, I, I get that there could be some... Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, oh, no, 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 no. My bad. Yes, I should have known better. But Kev is not a D-bag, but he just wrote. Yeah, he is. Yeah, I guess he's a yeah, D-bag. So you, <laughs> but you're not a Reds fan, so you would say, screw you, L.A. De La Cruz. But what about the Guardians? <laughs> Absolutely. If uh, anybody. If, look, man. Look, Kevin. <laughs> let's be clear, man. Can I see that paper? Absolutely. No <laughs> doubt. No doubt. Look, man. I, I'm here for the fans. I'm a man of the fans. Oh, no, I want that other one. Uh, oh. I want that one. Oh, <laughs> you want the, the, I'm gonna, the, yeah. the scribble? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'm a man of the fans. Look, man, the home run, and, and especially in baseball, this is different <laughs> from, you know, the NFL or the NBA. Like, we all know when the ball goes into the stands in the NBA, you give it back to the ref. Like, you don't keep it. But baseball has made it known, like, hey, man, the ball goes into the stands. It's yours. Like, that is part of the selling point. That is part of the tradition of Major League Baseball. If I catch that ball and, A, a staff member of whatever organization comes up to me, and especially, like, if it's a <laughs> Barry Bonds, like, way back in the day, Barry Bonds, a uh, home run, breaking uh, home run ball, and they just say, yeah, we just want it back, and they're not offering anything, well, guess what? I'm going to just go ahead and hang on. I'm going to say, no, thank you. I'm good. You you'd be a polite d bag is what you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> you would be. Yeah, yeah. I'm always polite. I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. Like like I'm reading the article and she didn't even get to meet him. Like at least like all right, man, let's do a little quick meet and greet picture. Let's sign some bats and some gloves and some balls and a jersey and something. You got to give the people something in order for them to give that to you because by rule, by the way the MLB works, when the ball is in the stands. Whoever catches it, it's your property. It doesn't belong to the player or the team anymore. It belongs to the person that catches the ball. So I blame baseball a little bit for this as well because you bring up a good point. They're not, you're not, you're not breaking the rule. There's no like, there's no rule that you have to give it back. You know, you go to a football game, you have to throw the, fo you can't hold on to the football right. for whatever reason. It makes its way into the stands and all that stuff. Basketball, let's say, just randomly bounces off someone's foot and somehow it skies into the, you know, fifth row. 
uh, for you rich people in the fifth row, you catch that. Jack you know, Nicholson you, just sitting there hanging yeah. on to the ball. It's mine like, no, now, man. Sorry, no. Bron. Yeah, what you going to do? <laughs> well, you know, uh, baseball technically doesn't have that rule, but it should. I don't – look, I like the fact that you go to the ball, you know, you, you the ballpark, you bring your glove. You know, as, part, as a kid, I remember how cool that was. You know, I uh, lived in El Paso growing up, and, uh, the you know, the at the time they were the El Paso Diablos. Um, I remember as a kid, the reason, I, the reason I, beca- I fell in love with Gary Sheffield at the time is because mm. Gary Sheffield was playing a game – um, where and they're now the El Paso Chihuahuas, by the way, it's wild. Uh, but the El Paso Diablos, they go from the Diablos to the Chihuahuas. I mean, really, <laughs> yeah. So, but I remember that's where I saw Gary Sheffield for the first time. But you know, I'd always bring my you know glove as a kid, and you know, I remember one time I did. You know, players kind of threw the ball to me in the stands. That was the coolest thing, right? Like, I mean, that was so cool. Now that's just a random ball being thrown in. But I do think ba- I do think that baseball should step in and say, hey. Any ball that's hit into, you know, obviously the line of fans, you know, it's it's your ball to keep. However, that's at the discretion of the team. If there is some kind of monumental career milestone, um, the the team has the right to go and request to get that ball back, and there is no negotiating, right? That I, I so that's on baseball, in my opinion. So for those of you, the reason what's led to this conversation is. Last night, Shohei Otani hits his first home run as a Dodger, okay? Now, this is an article from Sam Bloom from The Athletic. It all happened so quickly for Amber Amber Roman. The lifelong Dodgers fan watched as her husband dove to the ground with others in search of Shohei Otani's home run ball. Is that you or me? Okay, cool. (laughs) Sorry. Then uh, Roman looked at the ground near her feet, and there it was. So that's just like a typical like uh, I mean that that's just like a some kind of comedy or just something like uh, you see these all these guys on the floor just fighting for it and the ball's not even there and someone just picks it up and oh so you have it right here, so this is where it gets interesting. Roman looked at the ground near her feet and there it was. She picked up the milestone baseball, Otani's historic first with the Dodgers, and pumped her fist in the air. Sitting in the pavilion, you always hope that you're able to catch a ball. Like oh that's the boring part. Here's where it gets interesting. Here's where it gets fun. Apparently. Her and her husband were separated by security at the game. They refused to, um, and I'm, I'm missing it here in the article because it started to freeze on me a little bit, uh, when they authenticate it. Mm-hmm. They refused to do that for her. Um, they kind of were using high-pressure sales tactics to intimidate her into giving the ball back. She ultimately, I think, got some uh, you know, items back, got a bat and a ball and some other autographed stuff, never technically got to meet them or anything like that. Um, that, that I have a problem with. I do believe that if you are a fan – Okay, and I get in Los Angeles, it's different. I don't know. How, I mean, people are Dodger fans, but I don't think they have the same type of um, love for their Dodger team that we do for our Reds team. Again, I talked about that a little bit ago. I think the difference is, you know, we feel more connected to our Reds because we watch them come up through the, the farm system, and you know, we watch them. We feel like we're a part of their journey to the majors. I just feel if it was for me, La De La Cruz, I cannot look at La or his representative and say, "Man, tell La what's it worth to him." I mean, I, I probably should. I probably should. I mean, I know I get, I make, I, I just roll in the dough here. All right. Every time I come here, my boss tries to give me more raises. I'm like, no, stop. I mean, like, come on. A man can only have so much money. But I just think that in that situation, now I feel bad for them. Because who's to say that they, you know, wouldn't have maybe given the ball back for a little less. But the, the high pressure sales tactics, intimidation, I'm not for that. I think that was wrong of the Dodgers. But it's the Dodgers. So do your thing. <laughs> it definitely is a Dodgers move. So let's flip this a little bit. You're going on a little lunch break. You go to your favorite restaurant. You're leaving said restaurant. And boom, there's a bag, a bag full of $100 bills. Is Justin Kenner picking up said bag and taking it to the police station? Or is Justin Kenner coming back to the radio station and saying, hey, Kev, look what I found? Oh, I'm bringing it back to the gas station, or gas station, to the to the radio station. That's the same well, thing. Well, no, I do got to stop at the gas station because that's probably <laughs> going to take up most of that money. That damn truck of mine that's like it's 15 miles to the gallon. I'm going to have to fill up that expensive truck with gas. And then what's left, bring it back, the few bucks that I have left. Um, but it's not the same thing. It is. No, because I don't know whose money I stole. Finders keepers. But that's not a finders keeper yes, situation. No one lost anything. We watched where it went. We watched you pick it up. No, no. Go what, back. What you if it's said, windy outside? What if my said, hat flies off? Someone picks up my hat. Are you going to be that keepers. shot? Finders keepers. Finders keepers, losers, weepers. They were looking for the ball. The ball was lost. Remember, you just said she looked down. Oh, and there it was. The ball was lost. And the ball it was lost found in the her. It found her. She found the ball. That is uh. her ball. That is her property. And she has the right to do whatever she wants to do. She want to keep it for a memento. Want to put it on her trophy case. She want to go to eBay. She want to sell it back to whomever. She should have kept that ball. Especially, especially everything involving Otani right now. Who's to say 
what the suspension could possibly be for him. Who's to say he may never play baseball ever again in the major league? Yeah, poor guy. She's trying to bankrupt him. Hey, she wouldn't be bankrupt to him. First he gets robbed by his translator. Now this lady trying to steal his ball. Yeah, and I mean, shoot. Think about, like, I don't think that any other sport out there loves merchandise like baseball. Loves the items and loves the trinkets and baseball cards and things of that nature. She could have sold that thing for a lot of money. (laughs) And she should have kept it. I wouldn't have gave it back. I wouldn't have gave it back. No way, no how. It's Kenner and Kev's show. What about the people in the chat? What would they have done? That's what I'm reading now. So Michael says, man, I hope he doesn't lose that Guardians hat later today. (laughs) It's, It's asking for some karma after this segment. It's nice, I know. It's fitted. Yeah, it's it ain't uh, going. It has the headset on top. It ain't going anywhere. It's six and two. That's what it is. Um, <laughs> so now Nate brings up a semi good point. Nate <laughs> in the chat on YouTube again. So Kinner and Kev's show. We've went on the Justin Kinner show Facebook page, which we're still on there live right now. Uh, we wanted to get that back up and rolling today, and it's officially off and rolling there. But we are live in the Chatterbox Sports YouTube um, chat right now. Um, a lot of you are already there, but go and check that out. I mean, that's where we're going to be hanging out weekdays from 3 to 5, uh, right here on 1410 ESPN Radio. But definitely want to interact with everyone who's taking the time to, to watch uh, the show, no doubt about it. So Nate says, I, and this is a good point. I mean, it's not like it was like your you know 100th home run, 200th home run, your 800th home run, whatever it is. He says, I just don't understand why Otani's first homer as a Dodger matters. Does he have a point? I mean, what is the historic? I mean, his first home run as a like Ellie De La Cruz's first home run as a Cincinnati Red, that would have been monumental to a point because that's his first major league home run. I mean, this could be Otani's first clean home run that wasn't bet on. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. Asterix, he's like Michigan. I just put an asterisk every, next to everything he does. But no, in all seriousness, do you? I, that's yeah, kind of I, a good I, question. It, I, it I kind of agree with question. that. It is a good question because, I mean, I just think. Especially for the Dodgers, I understand definitely why the Dodgers want it because, like, you know how, like, the Lakers and the Dodgers and the Yankees are. No matter what another player has done in their entire career, when they come to their team, like, they're trying to hold them and say, like, hey, man, you're you're one of us now. I mean, shoot, how many Lakers fans and people look at LeBron James like, yeah, he's a Laker? Well, yes and no. How many times, I mean, look at A-Rod. Like, some people view him as a Seattle Mariner. Some people view him as a Ranger. But, shoot, don't let the uh, people up there in New York. He's a Yankee. Like, like once they become a part of one of these organizations, they try to make you a part of the mafia, so to speak. So, like, I can understand from the Dodgers perspective. And uh, apparently, and, according to reports, Otani is. And I did not mean to yeah, do that. Yeah, I, I see what you did there. <laughs> I did not mean according to According to some reports, the mafia's had a lot to do with, I mean, I'm just, you know. I did not mean to say that. Look, at the end of the day, just everyone, <laughs> the biggest takeaway from this. Now, Kev wrote this down. I did yeah, not write yeah, this and down. And you know what? And also. I cannot figure out how to work this damn thing. There, there we go. I'm also calling major cap on you. For what? And everybody out there. That said they would get that ball back. I am calling major cap. And also double for you because you always try to say that I'm goody two shoes. That's true. <laughs> do I say I don't say goody two shoes? I say do gooder. You're a do gooder. Yeah. I say yeah. you're a do gooder. You are the do gooder in this situation. See, yes, this is no, the run. Like, yeah. so I just watched this movie on Netflix. I know we gotta go to Me break too. real quick. Yeah, I always watch oh, movies. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. So it's called uh Your Lucky Day, and it's about uh, <laughs> these people that are at a convenience store on a late night. So a rich guy comes in there just being extra or whatever. He scans this lottery ticket, he wins like ten million dollars. And they're basically trapped into this convenience store, and then people's, you know, urges start taking over. Like, hey man, he's He's like 50 years old. I can take him. I'm 25 years old. I can take him. All these good people turn evil when the money comes. So I'm calling major cap on everybody out there that says, oh, I would just simply give it back. Oh, here's your ball back when you could be holding basically a lottery ticket. So you're a, you are a horrible fan. Yes. If you hold if you hold your favorite players monumental ball hostage, you're a horrible fan. If, if that's what you are it a is, horrible fan. Yeah, if that's how you view it, absolutely. Look, my favorite baseball player of all time is Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, second, Kenny Lofton. Third, Albert Bell. If any of them hit a home run and I caught it, I'm keeping it. I'm keeping it. Man, oh man. Not, 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 not saying I'm keeping it and holding it for ransom, but I'm keeping that ball. Now, if it was a Ken Griffey Jr. like monumental home run, I'm selling it. I'm going to hold it and then I'm going to sell it. 
like I said, capitalism. It's up to baseball. Every ball that gets hit, you know, foul ball, whatever, home run ball, fine. But they have, you know, to their at their discretion, they should be able to go and say, hey, that's that's ours. Give it back. Give you it back. know the backlash they were received. There's no backlash at the NFL when they got to get the football back or the basketball. But it's never been that way. It's never been. Hey, you keep the ball. But and rules are the rules. Follow the rules, folks. They I'm a are. rule. I'm a rules they follower. They are. The ball is hers. That's my boss. <laughs> Let me shut up because we were so so good on the clocks yesterday. No, we, no, no, we're good actually because that first uh, fifteen minutes. Oh, we're good. Fifteen then. minutes, we are good. Look we're at golden. Us. I mean, you're still a yeah. Fill in the blank, but you know. <laughs> All right, five one eight fourteen ten. So we'll open up the phone lines nine three seven five one eight fourteen ten. Our our buddy Shaw and Shaw will be happy to know that there seems to be another Michigan fan in here, Alex Wallace. Uh, shout out to Alex Wallace in the chat. He says, uh, wow, dude still hung up on Michigan. I will never forget how you guys cheated to win a national championship. I will never forget. What are they? Cheaters. Correct. Cheaters. The national cheating champions of the 2023 college football season. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, I, I'm going to cheat because you'll you'll be rewarded for cheating, apparently. Yes, I will. Yes, I'm still caught up on it. I mean, yeah. But Shaw is a big Michigan fan, and he's chiming in on the uh, – on the Facebook page, Kevin, and, and he says, look, he's a big Braves fan, lifelong uh, Braves fan, and he said if Acuna hit a, a monumental home run, he would keep it. That doesn't surprise <laughs> me, coming from a Michigan fan. Smart man. No values whatsoever. None. None. <laughs> Horrible people you are, all of you. You are well, lying to your I'm team, not. Man. I would not. I would. I could not be a I, – I, I love the Reds. I could not so, – so, so, I could so, not so, tell Ellie Cruz, hey, get bent, buddy. Uh, it is mine now. So I hear you keep bringing up the Reds. So let's just say you, you went to L.A. Yep. Uh, a couple summers ago. So say you're out there for a Dodgers and random team, uh, yep. Padres, yep. and a uh, home run goes out there. Are you going to keep that ball? No, I'm a Dodgers fan. Or, yeah, I'm, an, I'm not a Dodgers so fan. So it okay. only because it's the Reds. You would give it back only because yeah, it's the Reds. But I'm assuming this – very nice lady who picked up the ball was a Dodger fan. She Horrible just, Dodger fan. She could have just been going to the game with her husband. Typical. <laughs> Wait. No. Let's just go. Let's wrap that one up. We'll be right back. Kenner and Kev, 1410 ESPN Radio. 518-1410. That's the number to call in. We'll be right back. Hi. Joey Beckett here at Arby.
Make sure you go and check that out. We are off and rolling here on a Friday. So if you're just joining us, we hope you had a great week. Uh, we are Dayton's Radio Home of the Cincinnati Reds. They'll be back in action after their second off day. Already in their second off day. I mean, my goodness. But Reds back in action tonight, 4-2 and two on the season. Hunter Green on the mound. It'll be his second start of the year. He'll be going up against Jose Quintana and the New York Mets. Coming up later on tonight, of course, we'll have pregame coverage starting at 6-10 with first pitch at 6-40, all right here on 14-10, wing AM. So let's pick up with the conversation. Kevin and I, uh, with Shoya Otani last night, hits his first home run as a Dodger and led a lot of drama. Uh, obviously, that ball was picked up, and Shoya Otani, the Dodgers, wanted it back. It was his first home run as a Dodger, um, and they wanted that ball back. And unlike other sports... You know, when the ball does go into the fan zone, into the fan area, they, they get to keep it. And I disagree with that. I think that the, the team should, you know, at their discretion, be able to go and say, hey, you know, if that's just a regular foul tip ball, whatever. It's your, but if it's a historic ball in their eyes, it's their property, it's their ball, it's their league, they should be able to just go and take it. That's not the case. But forget that because no one's going to agree with me on that side. No one's going to take baseball side. But look at it from this perspective. If it was your team, if it was a player on your – if you're at the game, I mean, everyone loved Joey Votto, right? Everyone drooled over Joey Votto, right? Joey Votto could do no wrong, all right? He could hit 176 and everyone would drool over Oh, wait, he did do that, and you all drooled over him. Hey, he could do no wrong. Joey Votto, let's say he hit some monumental ball and you catch it, and he wants it back, and you say, no, Joey Votto, F off, buddy. You ain't getting that ball. It's my ball. What's it worth to you? You're a bad fan in my eyes. Kev says – capitalism whatever it is you were yeah, saying earlier. yeah absolutely okay i just couldn't do that to my team now if i'm at the dodger game like when i was at dodger stadium if i if i get get that ball and one of them guys want it back I'm like nah i don't care about them i don't care about the dodgers i don't care about their players i don't care about you betcha shohei otani i don't care about him Mm-mm. nope but if you're a dodger fan you should give it back no nah. no nah. fair enough give me something give me something give me season tickets give me autograph bat something that's what's wrong with our society today not it is, is nice. It is do good or as Kenner. Here. I'm taking it up to an auction site and I'm making some money. So let's see. Uh, Fergie Fowler on in the chat says you used to not be able to keep the baseball. Fun fact from Wrigley tour. Really? So what changed? Yeah. Do tell. Yeah. Enlighten us, please. I bet it was that damn Obama. That's <laughs> who, I bet it was Obama that changed that rule. You know? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. 518-1410 to the phone lines we go. Well, I mean, look, I, I'm going to get buried in this. I, I, I get that. But uh, let's start with Jerry. Jerry, you are up, sir. You're live. How are you? It's been a while. Doing well, gentlemen. How are you? Living the dream. Happy Friday. What you got for us? First of all, I'm calling cap on you. Kev is exactly right. If I catch a ball, I don't care if Joey Votto hit it, uh, Pete Rose hit it. I don't care. They're giving me something for me to give it back. You know what that makes you? I mean, <laughs> I can't, I'm not going to call you. I'm going to be nice to the man and still a good fan. No, that's what it makes. You're me. holding a ball hostage against the team you like. You're a horrible fan. No, I'm not. First of all, first of all, I don't know who the comment was that you just read before we came back on the air. But I've been going to baseball games since I was a little kid, the mid seventies, and you were always able to keep the ball, at least in Cincinnati. So it so. wasn't Obama's fault then, right? <laughs> no, man. I'm not, I'm not even. Uh, gonna, gotcha. I'm, yep. not, I'm not even. I'm not even going to dignify that with a response. Man. Because you have nothing to say. Because it's so ridiculous what you it's just not, said. It's not ridiculous. It's, it's, it's when's it ever been? When's it ever been the rule that in? Uh, the I've NFL acknowledged that it's a rule the in the NFL that you can't keep the football. But when you you open the door to say it's why you bring the glove to the baseball game. That's not why you get because to keep the baseball. You, keep you get to keep the, the baseball because they, they let that. you keep the ball. It has nothing to do with the glove. The glove is just a nice little accent, little piece that you can bring. I, I mean, look, look, look. Bottom line is, you're a horrible fan, Jerry. You're a horrible fan. No, I'm not. I'm a great fan, just like Kev. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. I mean, I mean, come on, man. And then the, my, my second point today is you guys were talking um, this week about the biggest threat to the Bengals. Yep. It's well, not your I Raiders. Mean, no, oh, I'm not phew. saying it is. Okay. I mean, although we'll be better than we were last year, but still, I mean, we're not going in the Super Bowl. I'm not, I'm not crazy. But I will say, I mean, isn't the question who's the biggest threat to the Ravens, right, outside of the Chiefs? The Ravens won your all's division last year. As far as I know, they're, they've, they've kept most, of, if not all, of their pieces. I mean, you all have – you guys, Browns, Pittsburgh, Bengals, you all have to get through them before you even start talking about Kansas City or the Super Bowl, right? I mean, 
the Browns right. split with them last year. The Browns, Browns have split within the last couple of years from a Browns fan perspective. Steelers split with them. Uh, they get, they got beat both times. Oh, Kev Steelers suck. Uh, that just be real, you know. Oh, you hey, slept them. Uh, why don't I not remember that? Oh, you did beat them twice, yeah, didn't you? Swapping. Well, yeah. again, the Ravens swapping. lost in the playoffs again. You know, best team in the oh, NFL. Sure. You know, I don't know. I, mean, I, I I can't look. The Ravens they don't intimidate me. I don't know why. I I look. I know they win a lot of games in the regular season, and they looked a little bit better in the playoffs this year than in years past. But in the biggest game of Lamar's career, came up flat again. Um, the guy gets excuse after excuse. I'm not buying into the Lamar excuse anymore. Continue racking up those uh, MVPs like Pokemon cards all you want. Bottom line is, I, I just he he doesn't do it for me. I, I'm not a Lamar guy. Not a Lamar guy. I got you. Well, and Pittsburgh, Kev's Pittsburgh team is going to be really tough this year too, man. I mean, let's not. I mean, they made the playoffs last year with a bum playing quarterback. Now they've got a couple dudes who actually can play. I mean, I don't know. Your old division is just a murderer's row. I know you guys beat I mean, that you, horse to death. But it's, did you watch it's Justin Fields insane. last year? Did you watch Russell Wilson uh, last year? Well, Russell Wilson actually had a pretty decent year. He just played for a terrible football team. Denver's horrible. Mm-hmm. Who do they have? I mean, you guys picked up Jerry Judy. I got news for you. He sucks, too. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, usually people I who mean, get dumped don't well, say nice things about their ex. I mean, let's just be real. Hey, the – the Denver Bron- uh, let me put it in perspective here. I'm going to be a little self-deprecating with this. The Denver Broncos words, have words. lost like 10 straight games to the Raiders. Mm-hmm. That's how bad Denver is. I never said Denver was good. That's my whole point. Well, they're terrible. So, I mean, if you're a quarterback, I mean, dude, that's quarterbacking the Denver Broncos is like trying to steer, uh, steer a ship that has holes in its bow and is sinking. It's impossible. They stink. Titanic so I'm just telling you, look, I'm not saying Russell Wilson is like 2010 Russell Wilson or whatever, but he's a decent ball player, but and Justin Fields got talent. I get that, but in a division with Joe Burrow, in a division with Lamar Jackson, in a division with, heaven forbid, he could stay healthy for more than one damn week in Deshaun Watson, you're talking about half of Russell Wilson and half of Justin Fields as being a threat. Yeah, I do. First of all, is Joe Burrow going to stay healthy? I mean, that's a, right. I mean, Deshaun, that's Deshaun thing. can't stay healthy, and you just cracked on the Lamar Jackson. So because, I mean, look, I'm not a big Kansas. Lamar guy, but I'll take him over Russell Wilson and Justin Fields any day oh, of the week. Sure, I, and, and I would too. But I, I, the rest of that Pittsburgh team is legit. That's why the AFC no, North look, is I'm the not, best division in football. I mean, there's not a bad oh, team in the North. That's the thing. Abs, you're absolutely right about but that. But, hey, we're getting 100%. off topic here. The big thing is you're a horrible fan. Jerry, thank you for the call. <laughs> All right. You guys have a good day. That Appreciate la- you. That laugh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't be mean. Man, what's well, wrong with you? You are out here Gosh. calling people bad fans and oh, D-bags. Me, no, you wrote it down. I'm just I'm holding it up. I am. Oh, you wrote funk on the back of this. I was really confused. Oh, yeah, those are the keywords. The keywords. Because we're giving away. What are we giving away starting next week? Uh, giving away tickets to see George Clinton at Andrew J. Brady Music Center. Going to be giving away tickets to see Janet Jackson at Riverbend. And we- going to as well. Oh, oh, and our Chatterbox oh. wrestling fans will like those as well. But. Yeah. All right, are you a bad fan if you – I think you're a bad fan if you hold a ball hostage, especially if it's your team. Like, if it's not your team, I don't really care. But. According to baseball, it is a souvenir. Hmm. It is a souvenir. Okay. Well, souvenir. Shaw, you are on. Welcome, sir. You're on live. How you doing, bad fan? What up? He's talking to you, Kevin. <laughs> what me. up? I'm a good fan. What up? What's going on? You see the company you're in, by the way. Yeah, hey, out look, there. let's be clear. If he catches a, a very famous ball and sells it, he's a smart man and just like me. Look, man, we're not bad fans. Hey, man, we're just taking the opportunity that was presented to us. Hmm. Yeah, it's no different than hitting the lotto. Exactly. No Bingo. Hmm. What's the Powerball up to it, nowadays? But being sick, exactly. I think it's over a bill. But um, <laughs> can Kenner even keep the ball anyway since he's an affiliate of the Reds anyhow? So, like, he's kind of playing both sides of the field saying he would turn it in. I, I, I hope not because technically I am too. <laughs> if like they came down to Kenner and he had the ball, like that's not going to look good in a, his affiliate sitting there holding the ball. No, I want to keep it. I want to keep. No, there, that, that's not going to look good. My affiliation. Uh, look, I almost got fired today, man. I'm telling you right now, and that's not a joke. I almost got fired today. If I went to the ballpark tonight. 
Which, by the way, oh, we should go to the ballpark tonight and get one of these nice little badass Ooh. little City Connect bobbleheads, uh, nonetheless. But that's uh, a nice souvenir you got there. Let's just assume my boss fired me today, like I thought was going to happen, and then I go to the ballpark. I'm not giving it back no matter what. I'm a good fan. I'm a good fan. I'm a good person. Uh, D- giving a ball back once it's hit in the stands does not determine whether you're a good fan or not. Sorry, it does. I mean, I mean, look, look, you're a bad fan. You support cheating. You're a Michigan fan. What do you know? <laughs> I'm glad you brought it up. I, I really am. Um, where's the NCAA sanctions? It, it's April. Who cares? You know how oh, to. Now, 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 now I will. Now I will agree with Kenner on this point. Yeah. You know how the NCAA works. They won't come with the punishment in April. They probably won't come with it until, like, there's media day, uh, Big Ten media days, like, what is that, August, July, or something like that. Or if they don't do that, then the NCAA will wait till like, Michigan's uh, 7-0 and and about to play uh, at USC or something like that and then drop the news on Thursday to basically derail the whole situation. You know how the NCAA does. They're not going to do it when, you know, something else important like March Madness is going on. They're going to wait till they can get all the attention on them. You know how this works. Oh, you mean like the same NCAA that said they weren't going to do anything? Yeah, yeah. They they say a whole bunch of stuff. Just like they oh, waited, I, just like the NCAA, just like the NCAA waited until, or the Big Ten waited until the night before they left to go to Penn State to play before they hit Jim Harbaugh with the suspension. They, that's what they do. They wait to the very last second oh, to, to embarrass teams, for lack of a better word. And by the way, oh. even if let's just say that they, you know, they don't do anything, do you think that that means you guys didn't cheat? Because you guys did. Oh. Oh. Mm, in your opinion. No, that, that, that's not even an opinion. Like, that's a fact. Like, I mean, they didn't give – I mean, Jim Harbaugh was if using was, PTO in all those games he missed this a, year. <laughs> if it was such a fact like all Ohio State fans want it to be and all fans who hate Michigan want it to be, if it was such a fact – Why did Harbaugh get suspended? Like, kind of like Reggie Bush. He didn't get suspended by the NCA. Why did he get he suspended? suspended by, Why does it matter who's suspended? He actually didn't even get suspended by the. He did. Man. He missed how, like six games. How, I mean, how, I mean, how many? Suspensions? Because Michigan gave him the suspension. I thought you said he didn't get suspended. No, no, I said he didn't get suspended by the Big Ten or the NCAA. Is what I said. Why does it matter who suspended him? A suspension is a suspension. Why did he get suspended? Oh, now we're just going to just change. We're just going to no. Change it I'm all not. Cha- you're it's the one that's changing it. It's changing everything. We know the NCAA no. hasn't technically come down and punished him yet. That's why you just said what happened to the NCAA. That's what we're talking about. And. Did so when the when the Big Ten suspended him? Oh wait, the Michigan had to accept it in order to get him. Had to accept what? 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 They won the national championship. Had to accept what? They cheated. Who cares? Had to accept what? The national championship. Had to accept what? January eighth. What happened? The sixth or the eighth? (laughs) January eighth. What happened? January eighth. What happened? It was the second tra- worst travesty to happen early in the month of January. They cheated to win a national championship. Oh, yeah, you're going to bring up – never mind. I'm not even going to go there. I'm not mm. even going to go there. Mm. I'm not even going to mm. go there. No, the best thing that happened to college football was Michigan won the national championship. The best thing? Why'd, the why'd best Harbaugh thing. leave? That's cap. Why'd Harbaugh leave? Because he wanted to win a Super Bowl – uh, in the NFL, and you can't win. You want to run it back. You want to run it back. Uh, he, he didn't think he uh, probably because he would have to play by the rules next year. I, I get why. Can he you win? A, can you win a Lombardi Trophy in the in the NCAA? And you can't win another national championship whenever the sanctions come down. He, you know, so I'm just saying. I, I mean, he tucked his so tail. He, he, that just mysteriously are going to show up out of nowhere. That's the only thing you guys can hold on for the entire off season. You're just mad because your you championship's ahead, hold, tainted, dude. It's tainted. Just it's hold like Barry up, Bonds' home run record, tainted. Go ahead, and hang. Go ahead and hang that other off-season banner. You guys keep hanging every off-season. What's that go off-season ahead and hang banner? Another one. What's that off-season banner? Oh, you guys win the off-season every year, but somehow you just can't seem to win in November. Oh man, now you sound like a Bengals fan doing the whole "you won the off-season" thing. My gosh, what's wrong with you? No, Your I team don't sound cheated, like a Bengals dude. fan at all. Your team My cheated. My team actually wins. My team actually wins something. Well, you know, if the Bengals actually cheated.
And we are back. It's the Kenner and Kev Show, Dayton's ESPN Radio, 1410 Wing AM. Yes, you just heard there. Uh, five straight hours of local sports talk here in the Miami Valley. It all starts uh, every weekday, of course. Weekdays at 1 o'clock, of course, off the bench with Trace Fowler and the guys, of course. And then they walk it right up to 3 o'clock, hand it off to us, and we take you up to 5 o'clock on Chatterbox Sports, 6 o'clock on uh, 1410 Wing AM. Um, we have quite a few local shows as well, Kev, including Card Subject to Change, Benjamin Chimera. Scoot that in just a tad. It's, it's catching the, the There we background. go. My bad. Right. We're good. Right. A little more. Oh. Hey, there we go. All right, how about this? It only took an hour for me to figure that out. We're good. Oh, there. Yeah. Hey. There we go. We're learning the cameras. We're all learning. We got the audio fixed from yesterday. Appreciate everyone in the chat who was kind of giving. They, they were our producers today, uh, at least kind of giving us the update. Uh, Brad and everyone at the beginning of the broadcast, we appreciate you. Brad Mays. So um, I don't even know what to read. I'm not going to read that one. Hey, so one thing on the show we like to do um, is our non-sports headline of the day. And Kev found it. <laughs> this is like out of nowhere. So this is coming from CVS News. Hypersexual zombie cicadas infected with a sexually transmitted fungus expected to emerge this year. Trillions of cicadas will emerge across several United States states this spring and event one expert dubbed Cicadagon. Oh, like cicada gonorrhea? Like cicada <laughs> So sexually transmitted diseases from cicadas. We go from COVID to that, like there's nothing in between that. We go from COVID to sexually transmitted cicadas. No in between. Yeah, this is great. So apparently there's two types of cicadas, the ones that emerge every 13 years and then some that emerge every 17 years. And they are set to emerge together. That's why we're getting trillions of cicadas across the Midwest. I can handle the cicadas. It's the stuff that comes with the cicadas I'm a little concerned about. The the, the STDs are the shells that are going to be just laying all Definitely over. Definitely the, the STDs. <laughs> I mean, my gosh. I mean, I'm, I'm here to tell you, we fell for the mask thing. I don't know what mask you wear for that. I don't, I, I don't know what mask you wear to protect you from the STD cicadas. So for people, especially our Cincinnati listeners and everybody in Kettering knows where we are, um, but in our field, in the radio station, we have geese that live in our field. Ugh. We have deer. We have fox. Um, just so many living animals that live in our backyard, which is which is fine, except for the geese when they lay their green turds all over the parking lot and then try to attack us. But now we have to worry about the cicadas as well and dodge the green turds in the parking lot. And don't leave after the sun goes down because you got to dodge the fox as well. I mean, look at the it, beavers too, <laughs> um, and that bald eagle that's on the uh, on the tower as well. So yeah, we got a lot to deal with here at good old seven one seven. Well, those geese are scary as hell. Yeah, every time I get like, every time I get out of my truck, I start walking to the front. They come swooping in. I took a video one time, like just in case. <laughs> but then I chickened out, and you hear me like it kept recording, and you just hear me awkwardly like fighting this goose in the background. I'm swinging my bag at it, I'm yelling the f word. You know, just another Tuesday, you right. know? Very avoidable. It's 100% avoidable. Not very. It's 100% avoidable, according to some. But <laughs> I'm not wrong. Kenner and Cap, 1410 ESPN Radio, Chatterbox Sports. You can tell it's Friday. I'm sorry, guys. Like, we're not doing a good job. I, I mean, I think we're doing a good job. But like, I, I love the show. We're not very, <laughs> like, buttoned up today. Um it's the case. We got a case of the weekends uh, as far as that's concerned. But uh, yeah, day two on the Chatterbox Sports Network. Uh, day two here in Dayton of carrying um, off the bench with Trace and those guys. Uh, I'm pretty excited about that. And uh, I'm excited. Like next week will be the first full week. We'll have a couple off days, I guess, technically because of Reds baseball. But you're off next Friday because your birthday's next Thursday. Yeah. A big celebration going down for me next Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Going to turn up all weekend long for my birthday. But uh, my birthday actually falls on uh, the 11th, which which is a Thursday, which is the day of the Reds play, so you won't be on the air either. But if anybody wants to, you know, send your boy a gift, just holler at me at one Kev Nash on Instagram or Twitter. I will gladly send everybody my Cash App link. Well, next week's it's payday, but as you know, I'm not getting paid next week. So yeah, I yeah, on your own, gonna be you in the negative balance. I yeah, I just walk around all day, just holding up this this paper sign. <laughs> well, know? if you catch a baseball and sell it, then you have some money. No, nah, I'm a loyal fan. I'm a good fan, dude. <laughs> I'm a good fan. I will not hold my teams hostage. I'm a good fan, nonetheless. All right. Um, where the hell? What, we had a plan between the STD cicadas and 
the goose droppings in the parking lot. That's how we kick off hour two. Oh, God. That's how we do this. It's so funny, hour two. So I mean, funny. we're going to get back to sports here in a moment now because that is the whole point of this. But, yeah. um, you know, oh, we got the eclipse next week, too. Forgot about that. And I have a secret. I, I need to admit something. I don't care about it. I just don't. Why is everyone losing their mind over it? Because it only happens once every 20 years. But, like, it's kind of like Shohei Otani's first home run as a Dodger. And <laughs> what, what am I missing? What am I missing? Like, maybe like some like government conspiracy theory out there that they're telling everyone to put these glasses on so when they look up, it just blinds everybody, and that's how the government takes control. Oh, uh, well, we'll be on the air when the eclipse happens. Will we? Yeah. It happens once every 200 years, and we're going to be on the air? Yeah. We'll be Not working. me. I'm going to be out in the parking lot, fighting <laughs> off the goose, looking into the sun, <laughs> blind to myself. Burning holes into your retina. <laughs> So I have a pair of the safe glasses to wear, so I, I put them on in the house. I couldn't see anything. <laughs> I, I think I have a pair. I don't know. We should have got a pair here, but oh well. Do you think we have time? Probably not. Probably not. Probably not. Um, let's see. What's going on here? i got to read that. i got to be careful what I read on there without proofreading it first. So yeah, 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 yeah. Do that. Just do wait. that. Uh, we got Tom Nichols coming up, Voice of the Dragons. The Dragons uh, have their um, season opener tonight, Day Our Ballpark. It'll be a little chilly. Uh, but it looks like the rain's going to hold off a little bit, so that's good. Uh, but I'm excited. Look, Rhett Lauder, the Reds' number two prospect, is going to be on the mound. He was their first-round draft pick last year. And the thing that's why we're going to talk about this with Tom, like with you would think that the Reds' farm system would be pretty bare with all the top names that they've called up over the last couple of years. I mean, you have so many guys, so many star players for the Reds who are in their, you know, not really first year so far, but in second and third year players. I mean, these are all guys that have been called up over the last couple of years. But – I mean, there's a sea of names still floating around in Dayton and Louisville and, and, and throughout the system that it's like, man, this team, they're going to keep going. Now, whether or not these names actually make it all the way up to the main roster or used in some kind of trade at some point, if they need to bring in another star, who you know, who knows? But the bottom line is, is it's pretty wild that the Reds just keep, you know, building up and just really starting to, you know, build this roster up, not on the main roster, but just throughout the system. You know, that was the biggest problem was the Reds' farm system for the longest time. You know, if you think back to the early 2010s when they initially started the rebuild, you know, their their system wasn't as deep. You know, I mean, they, that success of the early 2010s, that was because of their system. And, you know, when you looked at the the Jay Bruce's and the Frazier's and the Vados and those guys and, and the Cueto's, like those are the guys that they – that they developed and that they brought up through the system. And we saw a lot of those guys play in Dayton. Um, and a lot of what we're seeing now is what we saw in the early 2010s. But then they butchered that rebuild. They waited too long to move on from guys like Frazier and Bruce and Phillips and all them. They waited too long. And there just wasn't a whole lot in the system. And I just remember kind of going to one of our media affiliate days and them talking about the, the, the switch that they flipped was, you know, a lot of times when you are dropping payroll, everyone thinks that right away you're starting to look at, okay, well, they've, dumped all these players where's all the money going the money that they shed is not always just used to go buy another pitcher or to go buy another you know infielder outfielder a lot of that money was put into their their scouting department into the developmental system and they really started to make that a point of emphasis i talked with karen forgus uh you, you know of the cincinnati reds when we were there on opening day and just she was talking about just when they decided to really flip that switch and how it's already paying dividends right off the bat you know they started putting focus on not just developing in the minors but developing while putting an emphasis on winning um, and it's not a secret that why now all of a sudden you bring up this youth movement you bring up a Matt McClain and a Spencer Steer and a Ellie De La Cruz and a Christian Encarnacion Strand and the list goes on and on and these guys who while they were developing in the minors they were also taught the importance of winning so when they come up to the Reds it's not one of those oh now we need to find the desire to win it's we've already had that passion and fire and desire to win while we were developing and now we just continue that trend here in the majors we've seen it and that's what I'm excited about for the for the Dragons coming up later on tonight to see guys like Cam Collier, to see guys like Rhett Lauder. Um, and we're going to talk about some of those big names here in just a little bit uh, with Tom Nichols when he joins us here in about 20 minutes, Kev. Uh, but, yeah, like that to me, I don't know how many Dragons games you make. How many Dragons games you make it out At to? least like three or four three summer. Or four? Yeah, 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 yeah. My problem with the Dragons, I don't have a problem with the Dragons. My problem with having the Dragons here in town like, I make it to more Reds games than Dragons games, and it's not because I don't like the Dragons. It's because I do the whole, well, they're in our backyard, like, hey, I'll, I'll go to plenty of games. And then we get to, you know, we get to July, you know, and August, and I'm like, well, damn, the season's pretty much almost done. Now I've missed out on my chance to go. I have to force myself to go because I always do the whole, oh, we have plenty of time. We have plenty Man, of time. Man, you go for the games, and obviously I always want the Dragons to win. I go for the good times. 
It's a good time, man. I, I mean, go for the dragons. Good dragons. <laughs> so, obviously, want the team to win, but, I mean, it's just a good time at the ballpark. They always got stuff going on, and not to mention all the bars and cantinas right down there by uh, Day Air Bar Park. So, you go to a good baseball game, hopefully they win. If not, you know, go grab a beer. If they win, grab a beer to celebrate. And if you catch a foul ball and they want it back, you give it back. You'll be a good Dragons fan. Not going to happen. Don't be a bad fan. Go Dragons. Support though. your local teams. All right. The Reds back in action tonight. They're breaking out once again the City Connect jerseys. Huge fan of the City Connect jerseys. So we'll uh, have the Reds uh, line up for you here tonight. Reds and Mets. Uh, game one at JBP. So we have that coming up for you again. Uh, we have a couple of these bobbleheads we're going to be giving away. And I'm trying to think how we're going to give these away to our new listeners over in the Chatterbox world because, you know, I think I have to make a stop over at the Chatterbox Studios next week and maybe bring some of these bobbleheads over so that some of the prize winners can come pick them up. I, I think that's how I'm not going to make them drive all the way to Dayton. I would make them just meet over in Hamilton, pick them up, pick up those prizes. But we have a lot of the, uh, let's see, what do we got? The Jake Fraley bobblehead. I mean, these things are cool. They break out the City Connect bobbleheads this season. By the way, the styrofoam in this pisses me off because it just... It's going to make that noise. What noise? I'm such a jerk. Oh, you're good. You're good. It wasn't that bad. What the hell is this? It's a oh, cape? is this coming to the side? Is this a cape? Oh, yeah. Let's see. Oh, oh, okay. So does he have... Oh, did I break it? No. Nope. Let's hope not. Oh, there's the back. Crap. Oh, well. Ah, he has ah, the... Yes, go. has the helmet. Nice, 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 yeah. nice, nice. But the, the, there's supposed to be a bat in there. My So the, my favorite bobblehead giveaway. I was a big Dusty Baker fan. I know, like, for whatever reason. I mean, we've, we're so far removed from the Dusty days. Where that was just like you brought up that name and it just instantly pissed everybody off. I was a big Dusty guy, but my favorite bobblehead was the Dusty uh, Baker bobblehead, and it had the little, little bat uh, barrel over here, and then had all the toothpicks in there. That was my. I think it's still over there, unless the cleaning people just yep. killed that thing. Yep. Is it still it's there? Still here. Oh. It's still here. Oh. Oh, look at that. The oh. green screen. Oh no, you moved the green screen. Oh uh, no, look now they see how. Oh, oh, look at that. We're back. Don't worry. Oh, there it is. Yeah. What's on the side there? Is that the bo- yeah with all the uh, toothpicks? Yeah, yeah, right there the divot um, to hold. Uh, yeah, well, we couldn't keep that, but yeah, that's my favorite bobblehead over there, nonetheless. But this Fraley one's pretty cool. And then I mean they're gonna have to try to get you excited about a Matt McClain bobblehead, even though he won't be playing for the year probably. But yeah, comes a little cape and everything. How about that? But we got these. We'll be giving these away. We'll be telling you how you can win a uh, family pack of Reds tickets to go see the Reds at Great American Ballpark, and we'll uh, make sure we get you hooked up with some with some bobbleheads. I got Extra. the ponytail. Yeah. Is Everything. it in a rubber band? I don't know what it is. Yeah, there you go. Ah, oh, that's cool. Get your own. Get your own. We'll be right back. Oh, oh, yeah. That's the Dusty Baker one. We'll be right back. Kenner and Cap, 1410 ESPN Radio. Happy Friday. Ah, uh, Chatterbox says, uh, how do we get those? We got some for everybody. We'll share. We'll share. ESPN 1410 Wing AM Weather.
1410 ESPN Radio, Dayton's radio home for Cincinnati Reds baseball. We welcome you back. It's the Kinner and Kev Show, 1410 Wing AM, Chatterbox Sports on YouTube. We welcome you back in here on a Friday. I hope everyone's had a great week. I haven't, but that's why I'm excited for the weekend. Actually, I've had a good week just dealing with weird people. Reds in action tonight, 4-2 and two on the season. Hunter Green on the mound. Their lineup for the Reds tonight, batting first and getting the start at second base. Of course, Mr. Jonathan India. Left field, batting second, Spencer Steer. Christian Encarnacion Strand will bat third and get the start at first base. Candelario, a little concerned about his health, but he's back in the lineup, so no uh, concerns there, hopefully. The designated hitter, he'll bat fourth. Batting fifth and in center field, Stuart Fairchild. Ellie De La Cruz at shortstop, batting sixth, batting seventh. Is Espinal again. He'll get the start at third base and bat seventh. Batting eighth is Will Benson, and he'll get the start on right field. And behind the plate tonight, Luke Bailey again, batting ninth, the catcher. Uh, there you go. So one more time, your lineup for tonight, India Steer and Strand, your one, two, and three hitters. Four, five, and six, Candelario, Fair, uh, Fairchild, and Ellie De La Cruz. And then Espinal, Benson, and Maley again, your seven, eight, and nine hitters. That's your Reds lineup again with Hunter Green. Uh, on the mound for your four and two Reds going up against Jose Quintana and the New York Mets. The Mets one and five on the season. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so we'll have that coming up for you. 640 uh, is the first pitch. 610 is when coverage begins coming up immediately after our show um, at six o'clock. So let's do a little association catch up. Uh, Kev Nash brings us the association catch up each and every Friday. We're off and rolling. Kev, let's get a little catch up on the association, on the NBA. No doubt. So, four-time All-Star, two-time NBA champion, Rajon Rondo officially announced his career coming to an end with his retirement now officially happening. Uh, he was kind of the last of the true point guards where you weren't required to have to be a dominant scorer in the league. I mean, he was a great rebounder. Uh, he was obviously a great facilitator of the ball, but a great leader on the floor. I don't think he gets enough credit. Everyone talks about the big three in Boston. You talk about Ray Allen and Paul Pierce and Kevin Garnett. He never gets lumped into that, uh, but he did his thing with the Lakers. I mean, he, tr he proved to be just a great leader at the point guard position. I don't think there's been a point guard like him since then, uh, but I was a big fan of his when he was in the league. Absolutely, absolutely. Like I think like him and like obviously they're from different eras, but Jason Kidd cut from the same cloth, not scores. Guys that are going to make the right play, put the right position on defense, do all the little things. And, you know, when you have shooter like a Ray Allen, a scorer like Paul Pierce, and a defensive leader like Kevin Garnett, you don't need to be out there shooting the ball 15 times a game. You need to make sure you're setting up those guys around you because those are the guys that are going to get you to the winner's circle. So kudos to Rajon for a great career. All right, next up. All right, Philadelphia 76ers are 2-0 and since Joel Embiid returned to the lineup. Can Philly and the former MVP make a run to the finals this year? Make the, I mean, what, where are they sitting at in the standings? Right <laughs> they now? are sitting in the eight. Uh, so they're, I mean, holding on. I mean, obviously they dipped off. You want to talk about the importance of the MVP. Uh, you know, you take him out of the equation and you look how far Philly drops. Look, we talked about the Boston and the Bucks and the Cavs being the top three teams in the East, but no doubt if Joel Embiid's healthy, they're right there at the top as a top four team, but now they're going to have to battle their way in through the play in at this point. But to get, you said what, to get to the finals? Yeah. Uh, I mean, look, I think the East is, is too deep right now. Look, I, I wouldn't pick them over Orlando. I'd pick them over the Knicks at this point, especially. I'm assuming that's probably in one of your, yeah, yeah I'll wait for that one. But I'd pick them over the Knicks. I'd probably pick them over the Pacers, but I wouldn't pick them over any of the teams in the top four right now in the in the Magic and the Cavs and uh, obviously the Bucks and Celtics. And I know the Heat, you can never count them out because they usually you know, flip that switch right about now. They beat the Bucks. If they match up with the Bucks, the Bucks will lose. Man, right uh, off the bat? Yeah, yeah. The Bucks, the Bucks look really cooked. The Bucks really need to play somebody that doesn't play any defense. They just need to get into a scoring situation with somebody. They don't want to play anybody with a dominant big man and a, or a team that plays any defense. So if you're a Milwaukee Bucks fan, you want to avoid Philly. You want to avoid the Heat for as long as humanly possible. But guess what? They're not. They're ultimately going to play either one of those teams in the first round. So it's bad news for the Bucks. All right, number three. Knicks big man Julius Randle underwent season-ending surgery on his right shoulder. Are the Knicks done? I think they're done. I don't think they were anything with him out there anyways. I mean, they were a very, very good team. I don't think they're an easy out of the playoffs. I, don't, I didn't look at them as a title contender anyways. So when you say, are they done? I always look at that as, are they a title contender? Are they not? They're done. Yes, they're not a title contender now. And I didn't really put them in that upper echelon of Eastern Conference teams to begin with when he was healthy. Although... When you had their three main guys rolling at the same time, they were like 11-1 and one when they were all three on the floor at the same time. 
So yeah, they're 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 done. Especially, I mean, it's unfortunate he makes it to this point. When you have a season-ending injury, I've always asked this too. If you're gonna have a season-ending injury, what's more crushing, having it in the preseason or like the first game of the season or right before the playoffs start? I don't know what is more crushing. You think about that Aaron Rodgers injury last year. What which is worse? You know, Rodgers. getting having a, a you know a season-ending injury with just a couple games to go ahead of the playoffs or right when it tips, uh, right when everything kicks or tips off. I don't know, but that's an unfortunate injury for Mrs. Mr. Julius Randle. Yeah, it really sucks because he injured his shoulder and like they've been trying to do rehab for the last couple of weeks, trying to get him back for the playoffs, and just the rehab just wouldn't take, so to speak. So, you know, the Hartensteins are back. Uh, OG and Anobi, he's trying to work his way back from injury, and a lot is being weighed on Jalen Brunson's shoulders. Now, he's a very good player, but, like, he's going to need teammates. This is not, you know, saying a solo situation. This ain't tennis. You need teammates. So I think they can still beat the Orlando Magic in a first-round uh, matchup. That would be the 4-5 or five matchup. But as far as, like, a deep run to the, you know, conference finals, I don't see that happening without Julius Randle. Next up. All right. The Cavs sit in third place in the East uh, at 46 and 31. Currently, the Cavs would face off against the Pacers in the first round. We talked about this last week about what their potential playoff matchup could be. Again, with just a few games left in the regular season, obviously, there could be some final seedings. Uh, no chance of a Knicks rematch, correct, in the first round? As of right now, it's not looking like it. Look, they, the Cavs have the bigs to go up against uh, the Pacers. You know, and the Pacers don't play defense. So the Cavs will be fine as long as they don't beat themselves. The Cavs' biggest opponent right now over at least the next couple weeks is going to be themselves. I mean, they've been losing some games that they shouldn't. But what's wild is, I mean, I don't think this Cavs team gets enough credit. I mean, I think, you know, for a team that is finally looking like a real NBA team post LeBron, I mean, 46 and 31, but it just doesn't feel like a good season right. just because the way that they've been playing down the stretch um, with the guy that many thought was in the MVP discussion before the all-star break. And they just haven't been able to get it going ever since. Yeah. Five games to go for the Cavs. I mean, right now, obviously you want to keep that third spot or maybe even jump into the second spot with the way the Bucks are playing. But the biggest thing now is health because Donovan Mitchell has been banged up uh, the back half of the season. Seemed like once the other guys like Garland and Mobley got back, he got hurt. So, like, there's no continuity going on there. So, with these five games remaining, hey, if we're going to be playing guys on very limited minutes, let's do that so we can have some type of rapport on the court. Winning isn't necessarily the most important thing right now. Getting rapport and getting your rhythm back with the main guys is. So, when you do go into the playoffs, you are able to hit on all centers. You have to, for the Cavs' sake, play the Pacers. They can beat the Pacers. They can beat the Pacers in five, six games. They can do that. I'm not sure that they can beat the Orlando Magic. I think they can still beat the Knicks, even though the Knicks beat them up pretty bad last year without Julius Randle. If I'm the Cavs, I want to play the Pacers by any means necessary. So if that's a, a situation that we've seen in the Western Conference before, guys losing games to try to you know maneuver their way into playing a certain team, I wouldn't even mind it, to be perfectly honest. All right, next up. All right, last one. Bronny James, he is officially declared for the NBA draft as well as entering the transfer <laughs> portal after one season at USC. Look, a lot of people giving him crap for declaring for the NBA draft. The bottom line is, is there's a lot of players that you scratch your head at declaring for the draft, but I don't scratch my head because what they're de technically doing by declaring for the NBA draft, and I hate that they word it this way, we're declaring for the draft. You're not declaring for the draft. You're going to go to the NBA draft combine, and you're going to get evaluated, and they're going to tell you if you're worthy of declaring for the draft. I really wish that players would stop saying that. It drives me up the damn wall. I'm declaring for the draft. They say it because it sounds cool, and I don't think Bronny's doing it to sound cool. He's declaring for the draft, but keeping his college eligibility, so that, but he has entered the transfer portal. So we do know this. He will not play at USC next year we do know this he's not playing in the nba next year he, i mean he's gonna get evaluated they're gonna tell him what he needs to work on and i think that's smart i think that's brilliant uh you know from a local perspective here when obi toppin did it it worked out wonders for him they told him what he needed to go work on and he was a lottery pick the very next season uh you know deron holmes same thing i don't think he's, he's definitely not gonna be a lottery pick Good chance he does get drafted. Still a good chance he could potentially return to Dayton for another year. But the bottom line is, I had no problem when he declared for the draft last year. Just stop calling it that. Go get your evaluation. He's going to go get his evaluation again uh, you know, this upcoming uh, you know, draft or whatever. But, yeah, it's smart of Bronny to do this. I just think Ohio State, according to different sports books out there, um, have them as the favorite for him to end up landing with the Buckeyes. But another favorite, of course, uh, is Duquesne uh, because of the connection there with Drew Joyce, former point guard that won multiple state championships here in the state of Ohio with his dad, LeBron, back in the day. Wild, wild, wild. We're all old.
Absolutely. Whoa. So LeBron, uh, Bronny, <laughs> uh, average of 4.8 points per game, 2.8 rebounds, two assists per game. But the point that was startling to me is that his shooting percentage was so down or so bad. 36% uh, from the field, only 26% from three. And the biggest part about his game that, you know, so many people talked about that, like, you know, obviously they're going to compare him to his father, that everybody in their mom said, like, at his age, he's a better shooter than LeBron. At his age, it, talking about, like, him in high school, he was a far better shooter than LeBron. That did not translate to the college level. Um, and you're right. He's getting evaluated. And you know what? Every player out there in college sure. that has hopes of playing in the association or in any professional leagues across the pond should go ahead and get evaluated. Why, it does you no harm to go get evaluated. They're going to tell you what you need to work on in the offseason to better your chances of making the league. There's no harm in putting your name in there. Now, as far as his transfer options, I've been saying this since his name got put in there. In my mind, it's two destinations. It's either Oregon or it's Duquesne. I would love to see him at Duquesne so we can go see him at the arena. So go Duquesne. Yeah, Oregon was the other one, too. And, of course, there's that Nike yeah. you know, connection yeah, he's, he's not going to an uh, Adidas school. So, <laughs> Breaking news. That's not going to happen. So, obviously, Oregon, that was the other team in there. But Ohio State, and, like, I don't want to fall for this again because we went through it. That's why we had Adam <laughs> Charlie on and, and all this. He covers the Buckeyes for the dispatch. But, yeah, I, again, with them saying, according to multiple sports books, the Buckeyes are the odds-on favorite to land, uh, you know, Bronny when it's all said and done. The likelihood he does go to the league is what? Like, I'll say this while you think about this. Mm -hmm. Jeff Goodman. Uh, field of 68 covers college basketball said that this he had talked to multiple nba general managers who have said that this is one of the worst drafts in nba history so there's gonna be a lot of wasted picks if that's the case now there could be some good players that develop out of this that's usually what happens you know the drafts that you think there's gonna be a ton of talent coming out more times than not ends up being a big bust right then the draft that you think there's nothing in there you might pull a couple stars out of there who knows but there's two trains of thought on this if you're Bronny, you could say well if this is the worst draft in quite some time it might help my chance i'm going to be more of a recognizable name than anyone else in this draft right and there are going to be teams who might position themselves to draft Bronny specifically to acquire lebron when it's all said and done and it could be teams who are in a win now mode Bronny's not a guy that you go grab to be a win now team but if Bronny means lebron coming that's why i could potentially see Bronny ultimately still declaring for the draft because look Former Dayton Flyer coach is onto the Kupo. That guy was nowhere close to being ready for the league. He was not. He wasn't even ready to play in the damn A10. He was not good at Dayton. Not even close. Watch him. Watch him play against Auburn when Auburn came to the. He couldn't play. Okay, couldn't get out of foul. It was in foul trouble. I'm not burying the kid. I'm just saying he was not good for Dayton. But technically, Dayton likes to take credit and say, "Oh, coach is onto the Kupo was a one and done." Okay, he technically entered the transfer portal. He he basically decommitted from Dayton. Left Dayton. Then went to the league. Yeah, uh, but whatever. That's besides the point. Bottom line is he should not have been drafted. Why was he drafted, Kev? Because of his last name. Yeah. Because there was hopes of when Giannis got to free agency that they could maybe lure him over there. Uh, and that's ultimately what did not happen. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let's be clear. I think Bronny could potentially go that route, knowing that this is a horrible draft, knowing that if teams are going to waste draft picks on a bad draft, I think a team could waste a draft pick on him if it means potentially landing LeBron James. Yeah, we talked about this when we actually first started talking about Bronny hitting the portal. I'm just looking at the mock draft from the NBA. I'm just scrolling past here. I'm like, I'm into the picks of the 50s and things like that. I mean, recognizable names, I've, I've counted five. And now I'm not as big of a college basketball fan as I used to be, but like, you know, I still follow the game. And, you know, we're seeing the, the Edies, we're seeing the Deron Holmes, and like those guys are going in the 30s and the 50s and stuff like that. So, why not? Why not put your name in there? And, hey, if you get a draft grade of, hey, we see you at the 20 to 30 range, he's going. If he gets a draft grade of, like, 20 or 30, he is out of here. He is gone. He's going to the league. I don't see him ready, though. Oh, no, I don't either. I, I oh, would, you're right. Like, I, yeah, I, I would prefer that he goes back to school. And, you know, and also, obviously, we a lot of people forget the kid did have a heart attack. Like, that's, like, scary. Um, I would like to see him at full strength for one season like to see like his true game and all the things that the uh, league tells him to work on he has an opportunity to, to do that and be healthy i mean he had the heart situation and basically came right back to the team like he never really got his footing underneath him so those are the things that i would want to see 
It's the Kinner and Kev show here on 1410 ESPN Radio. That was Kev Nash's association catch-up. Dayton Dragons season opener, home opener tonight, Day Air Ballpark, 7 o'clock. Uh, and, of course, you'll have a chance to see their number two prospect in the system. It was the Reds' first-round pick last year, seventh overall, and Rhett Louder. He'll be on the mound. A lot of excitement uh, surrounding the Dragons. And now we're going to talk with the voice of the Dragons, Tom Nichols. And we'll hang out with him when we come back. More of the Kinner and Kev show when we come back. All right, and we are back. It's the Kinner and Kev Show live here on 1410 ESPN Radio and, of course, the Chatterbox Sports Network off and rolling here in hour number two. Uh, so last week, of course, we've, I mean, finally had more than a handful of games to dive into when it comes to the Cincinnati Reds. And after their second off day in the infancy stages of the season, they're right back at it tonight. City Connect night. Pretty excited about that. And we'll talk more about the Reds coming up here in just uh, a little bit. But uh, tonight, the opener, the home opener, the season opener, for the Dayton Dragons, of course, and I'm excited to bring on uh, who's a regular guest on the show last year, will be this year as well, the voice of the Dayton Dragons. We have Mr. Tom Nichols. Tom, it's been a while. Welcome. How are you, sir? Hey, Justin. Thanks for having us on today. You know, I missed, I, you know, I didn't introduce you correctly. I now have to say Hall of Famer 
Tom Nichols uh, <laughs> joining us. Now, congratulations okay. on that, by the way. Thank you very much. Appreciate the, the kind words. But uh, opening night coming up tonight. Again, you've been doing this uh, for quite some time. How does uh, tonight's opening night, as you prepare for this, how, how does tonight's, uh, how does this season, the start to this season, differ from other seasons as far as the preparation heading into this year? Well, the preparation on my my part was the same as it always is, but the, the team itself, I'm, I'm not sure I've ever seen a Dragons lineup as deep as this one. Um, there might see, you, you might see some question marks with the pitching. We'll see how that goes. The lineup itself, just to give you an idea, I mean, Ruben Ibarra last year hit cleanup for us and, and led our team in home runs and RBIs, and he's back and he's hitting ninth. Um, that gives you an idea how deep this lineup is. We're just stacked with prospects and big hitters throughout the lineup. So uh, that's something I'm excited to see. I mean, we've, we've really got 11 guys for nine spots. So that means every day you're going to see someone who, who would normally be an everyday guy not playing. And, and tonight it's, it's uh, Hector Rodriguez, who is a top 20 prospect in the red system. And a guy that was the rookie of the year in the uh, Dominican Winter League and, and, had, and finished last year with us and looked good, but no spot for him tonight. We're just we're loaded with, with uh, hitters in the lineup. We've got two catchers. Uh, one was a second-round pick. One was a fifth-round pick. I mean, a second-round pick is going to get a million-dollar signing bonus. A fifth-round pick is probably going to get three to $400,000 signing bonus. One of those two is not going to play uh, on a daily basis. So, hmm. Um, this is a lineup that's got a lot of depth to it, in, at least in terms of the offense. You know, that's what makes this uh, rebuild for the Reds so fascinating, uh, Tom. And again, I know we're talking Dragons, but when I think about the Reds and their rebuild right now and the fact that they called so many top prospects up last year, I mean, a good chunk of their lineup, a good chunk of their roster is, you know, first, second, third-year players. The fact that so many of those core nucleus guys have been called up out of the system over the last few years, it's amazing to me to still see the depth that is still continuing uh, to, to just move through the system. And we're seeing it here in Dayton. Obviously, last year's first-round pick, seventh overall, and Rhett Lauder are going to be on the mound tonight, which that's who I'm really excited to see, uh, you know, debut for the Dragons. But it is kind of wild time with as great as the Reds have been during this rebuild and all the names they've called up, the depth that's still behind everybody. I mean, the future for the Reds is bright, as we've talked about for years now. Right, no question about it. And, and I, I think a lot of credit goes to Nick Craw for the way he approached the trades at the deadline. Uh, he, he knew he had some players that if he wanted to move, were going to bring a lot back in return. And he, he didn't just move guys to move them and, and just take whatever was offered. I mean, you look back at some of the trades that were made a few years before, let's take Johnny Cueto, for example, they traded who was a 20 game winner and, and really didn't get much back. Um, same thing could be applied to like an Aroldis Chapman or even a Jay Bruce or a or maybe uh, somebody like um, uh, there's a few others, Todd Frazier, that could be in that same category. Really, just didn't get a whole lot back. Uh, they, they moved Castillo, Mali, uh, and got so much back in return. I mean, top prospects back in return, and that really has added so much depth to the farm system. When, when you, you're able to trade, for example. Um, uh, a Tyler Malley and get Spencer Steer, Christian Encarnacion, and another pitcher that you traded for Will Benson, all, all for Tyler Malley. That's an amazing trade right there. And, and there are several others that could be put in that same category. Um, the, the two trades with Seattle, they got tremendous prospects back in those trades. Uh, the trade they made with San Diego uh, to give up uh, Brandon Drury and get a, a, an infield prospect who's in our lineup tonight, Victor Acosta. The trade they made with the Mets to send Tyler Naquin to New York. They got two good prospects back in that deal uh, all, all the way down the line. Nick really took those seriously. He, he didn't just get rid of guys uh, because he knew that they were going to be free agents. He, he, he made deals to get prospects back, and that's really changed the whole farm system. You know, you've talked a lot about the position players and just some of the pop and the depth in the lineup, but what about, you know, as far as the pitching goes, as we mentioned, you know, Rhett Lauder, uh, last year's first-round pick for the Reds, is going to be on the mound tonight, but I also saw in a rehab assignment, you know, Ian Gabo is going to be uh, in Dayton tonight as well. Just talk about what the pitching looks like for the Dragons heading into tonight's opening night matchup. 
Yes, tonight uh, you will see Louder start the ball game, and it'll be his professional debut because they drafted him in the first round last year out of Wake Forest. Once they signed him, he already had 120 innings on his right arm, and and he did join our team as an inactive player just to learn the life of uh, of a minor league player, learn the, the starting rotation, what you do between starts, the travel, all those things. He was with us for a month or so. But never pitched, never was active. never. I don't think he ever even threw in the bullpen. Um, so he had enough pitches already on his arm after the, the college season ended. So he's actually making his professional baseball debut tonight. And I would expect about four innings. And then next time through, maybe that increases to five innings. And um, uh, so that'll be just very, very closely watched uh, for the fans who come out here. Or we're on TV tonight. We're on Dayton CW tonight. So that'll be a chance to watch the game locally, um, and uh, that'll be fun. And uh, you mentioned Ian Chabot, who led the Reds in appearances as a pitcher last year, had an ERA of under four, uh, didn't pitch at all in spring training, never threw an inning during the spring training process. So we should see an inning from Ian tonight somewhere in the game as well and, and see if he's going to be in the process of getting ready to come back and, and rejoin the Reds there. You know, they, they've got a pretty deep bullpen right now. It would be interesting to try to pick someone that you'd eliminate to, to open up a spot for one of the injured guys who's on his way back, and, and Ian Jabot is one of them. Sam Maul in AAA is, is another guy that's injured right now, and then uh, Alex Young, and then you've got Tony Santion in AAA, who wasn't injured, but coming back off an injury really looked good in spring training. I would expect there's a good chance by the end of the season you're going to see Tony Santion pitch in the seventh or eighth inning for the Reds, but right now he's in Louisville. So they've got roster decisions to make at some point as some of these injured players come back. Yeah, that's a good good problem to have, to have the depth, obviously, uh, you know, as we've kind of talked about today. And, you know, you don't want to get too far ahead of yourself. Uh, tonight is, is opening night, but – who are some guys that, you know, you never want to see that, you know, it's good for the guys when they're called up and, and they obviously get promoted a bit, but who are some guys that you don't expect to be on the roster for the entire Dragon season? Who's close do you think to being, who's the closest to being called up in your opinion? Well, I never honestly, Justin, pr- try to predict uh, roster moves because it's a, <laughs> it's just a losing battle when you try to predict those. But I would say the guys that are most advanced would be, Sal Stewart, uh, third baseman in the lineup tonight, hitting third for us as a 20-year-old. In a league where the average age is 23, he's 20 years old, and he's hitting third in that stacked lineup. Um, Really smart player, mentally advanced, understands a good two-strike approach, defensively understands the game, has gotten himself into, into better shape than what some scouts expected. When he was drafted in the supplemental first round, in 2022, there are a lot of uh, scouts immediately saying he's going to have to move to first base. He looked good at third base in the month or so we had him last year. So we'll see if that can continue. Um, and then uh, you you look down the lineup, there, there's a, a player that's really generated a lot of conversation by the name of Ethan O'Donnell. He's in the lineup for us tonight in right field. He played his college ball his final year at the University of Virginia. He had played at Northwestern two years before that he was he was not a real high pick I mean he was a sixth round pick so that that that, that's not a that's not a bad entry into professional baseball but not a first or second round pick but played like a first or second round pick in his short time in pro ball in fact he was the Reds minor league player of the month for his first full month of professional baseball in, in September of last year and I'm anxious to see what he can do out there I, I, you know, a lot of people privately have tipped me off to the fact that he's a guy with a lot of talent. He's hitting sixth in our lineup, and everybody ahead of him is is a is a top prospect, like a first or second round pick. So um, that's a guy to keep an eye on. Ethan O'Donnell in right field for us tonight. We've got potentially three center fielders in the outfield. All the guys in the outfield for us are guys who've been mainly center fielders. So it should be a very good defensive outfield that we put on the field tonight. And, and again, I mentioned Hector Rodriguez not a, in the lineup tonight because one guy's going to have to be out every day. He, there's not enough spots on the field for the number of quality players we have. And he's the guy tonight. He'll probably be in right field when he plays. We have Tom Nichols, the voice of the Dragons, hanging out with us here. It's the Kenner and Kev Show, 1410 ESPN Radio, and, of course, live on the Chatterbox Sports Network. 
Uh, you know, I remember uh, last year, Tom, you know, just kind of catching up with Marty Brenneman heading into the season. There was a player that he was really high on through the system, and that was Cam Collier. And that's another guy that I'm really excited to, to you know, to see up close and personal, to see at day or ballpark. Just what are you hearing about Cam Collier and what can fans expect from him? Again, you know, the Reds have are deep in middle infield throughout their system, and he's one of many big names coming up. Yes, uh, very interesting story. Um, Tom Archdeacon has a story coming out maybe, I don't know, tomorrow perhaps or sometime over the weekend on Cam Collier because he had a lengthy conversation with Cam yesterday at our media day. He, he took the path of Bryce Harper and that he finished high school at the end of his sophomore year to get draft eligible sooner. So he went to junior college for one year, which made him draft eligible at the age of 17. And uh, so he's a He's a guy finished high school at the age of 16 in the United States, um, went on to one year of junior college at one of the top junior college programs in the U.S., and then was drafted in the first round by the Reds in 2022, played last year at Daytona as an 18-year-old in a full-season league, which you, you, you just don't see that very often. And here he is with us now, high A, as a 19-year-old player, so age-wise, you know, I, you've heard you probably at some point, whether you've remembered or not, I don't know, but you probably at some point, if you listen to me talk, use the phrase to describe a young player. It's like having a freshman on the varsity in terms of the potential. Uh, he may not be the best player, but potentially you see it, and you know eventually he's going to be the best player. Well, with Collier, because of the way things went, that's more like having an eighth grader on the varsity. Um, and... and uh, so he is way behind age-wise, but if he can hold his own and play pretty well and show those skills, he'll catch up eventually. So he's hitting cleanup for us tonight as a 19-year-old, as the youngest position player we've ever had since we became a full a, 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 a high A club, youngest position player we've ever had since the Dragons became a high A club. Uh, he'll be 19 all year, so. Um, interesting guy to watch. Um, again, he's going to play. We, we've got two third basemen. Collier and South Stewart are both pure third basemen. So Collier's going to DH tonight. And, and Stewart might play a little bit of second base, perhaps, as well. So we'll see how that goes as they try to get everybody playing time. All right. Well, good stuff. Again, the Dragons, their home opener coming up later on tonight. Day or ballpark and the voice of the Dragons, Tom Nichols. Awesome enough to give us some time, not just on radio tonight, Tom, on TV, correct? That's right. We're on TV tonight on Dayton CW. All right. Well, again, a lot of exciting young names on this roster. Cam Collier, as we just talked about, Rhett Louder, uh, who I'm really excited to see. You talked about a lot of the great names on this roster. You talked about the depth, and we're going to get to see it uh, in action coming up later on tonight. Tom, uh, we appreciate your time. Again, congratulations on the Hall of Fame induction. That's pretty exciting. So thank you uh, for giving us some time today, and we'll talk soon. Thank you. My organization would also ask one thing of me, and that's to make sure I mention how to get tickets. Go to DaytonDragons.com slash tickets and uh, that'll get you where you need to go. Thanks for having me on your show, Justin. I appreciate it. Anytime, sir. Take care. More of the Kidder and Kev show on 1410 ESPN Radio and the Chatter Sp Chatterbox Sports Network when we come back. Cordell Transportation has